everypony! I'm Jeff Archfiend, and these are my thoughts on episode 4, Daring Don't. First up, I'd like to say a big thanks to Puppy Doctor and Ordon Rift, who are responsible for the avatar and intro music, respectively. Big thanks to you two. Description, links in the description below for Puppy Doctor's deviant art, And I'll figure out where Ordon Rift's SoundCloud is. This episode seems to have split the fandom and their analysts in two. Some enjoy the thought that the Daring Do books are an actual fact reality, and others are more adverse to the idea and kind of wish this episode didn't happen in this manner. Personally, I find myself more with the former than the latter. To me, it shows that there's actually more going on in Equestria behind the scenes than we had first been led to believe. Case in point, Daring Do kicking Aoi Zotal's monkey dog cat backside on a regular basis, foiling his plans. This seems to me to be some excellent world building for all the issues that is raised with the fandom in regards to the children's novels front. Darren Do said it herself that she works in secrets and can't really trust any pony. And she has these adventures, and obviously when you have adventures like this you kind of want to share them with the world, so she portrays them as children's books under an assumed name. There is actually a word, a real world example of this in the Andy McNabb books. I don't know if you get them over in America or anything, or anywhere else, but I know they're kind of popular in Britain. Uh, the author, whenever he's doing interviews, he kind of has to be in shadows due to his time as an SAS soldier. That's S-A-S. Okay, special services type, special unit type people. And he draws on his experiences from his life when writing these books. While Daring Do's novels can be more alike to autobiographies than these, the uh, same principle here remains. The gags in this episode were pretty decent. The One of the standouts being Twilight and Rainbow Dash as they both have fangasm moments over the situation, Twilight herself even going so far as to break the fourth wall a little. My mind is officially blown! Ah, come on, I knew it all along! My only real contention with this episode is quite probably the same as others have had, the 800 years of searing heat. Whilst it may have only affected the valley that this temple was located in, it never actually exactly said how these rings and this dark pillar thing was going to do this. Was it going to shoot a beam of magic into the sun thereby increasing the heat? Or was it going to project a magical dome over the valley that would act as a magnifying glass for the sun's power? Which, given the situation, I think would probably be more likely. Given that the sun does the whole global heat thing, you get what I mean. Unfortunately, I doubt we'll ever actually get the answer since the temple was destroyed along with the rings, and I doubt we're going to be actually seeing how this is explained in any Daring Do book. If it's the former rather than the latter, though, it does bring into question over how much power Celestia actually holds over the sun. Does she actually just raise it up and down and that's it? Although, as we saw in Winter Wrap-Up and in Sonic Rainboom when they were doing the tour of the weather factory, it seems more to be the Pekasai who control the temperature of the planet, given that they're the ones who make the snow and control the weather. On the whole, it was a decent episode which draws on some real-world examples to pull together, although it only actually really works if you know about these examples to begin with, I suppose. It was a little better than Castlemania, but again, not quite up to par with the opening, in my opinion. Let's hope that Flight to the Finish next week, well, this week, improves on this and doesn't continue the trend. Or else, <laughs> we're going to be in for a long season. Jeff Archfiend, signing out.